Um, when I knew that I was going to come here and have a chance in this room with this company, um, I said yes and yes because um, I don't think I've been anywhere to read or present that is as welcoming as this company and this place. Um, this is the end of book tour for a while. Um, and talk about ending on a high note. Um, I want to say two things. Uh, a very dear senior woman to me, uh, Wasco woman named Lillian Pitt and I both received the Governor's Award in Oregon a million years ago, I think. Um, and I marveled at how she accepted it and how she spread it out. She stood up in an audience uh, maybe three times this size and sitting in front of her in the first row were a group of elderly women from Warm Springs Reservation. And she said, I would like everyone to stand and I would like them to sit while you honor them. So she reversed the way we usually do that. And I was struck by it and remembered it. Uh, one day I'll be able to employ it. Um, and then she said something I never forgot and by which I have, I hope, modeled my life. She said, <clears throat> when the governor honored her, I am a project of my people, accepting nothing for herself and saying it is my people, my community that has come to life in me. And I would say that about myself with regard to many of the people in this room whom I know, whom I've known for a very long time. It is my love for them and the constant awareness that I had to measure up, I had to live up to all that that love meant in order to be a good person. And that means that whatever I have written has come from my friends. I also need to say that it's not right to honor me for um, whatever you read in a book like Horizon. I am an example of someone who has benefited for 50 years from people who know way more than I do. And what I want to say, express my gratitude for tonight is their patience with me. That I have been, um, when I was 21 and graduated from university, I was educated just enough to be able to say, wait a minute, after six years in a Jesuit prep school in Manhattan, and then six years at Notre Dame, I realized that I'd never known anybody except people like myself. They were all men, they were all white, they were all middle class, and they were all Christian. And I said to myself, how in God's name could that be an education? <laughs> so I, I went away. I went away uh, into the world um, and uh, I knew that the one thing I might have gotten at, at university that was um, worth holding on to was the sense that um, I was strong enough to make a fool of myself and not have to pay too dearly. So I could go to people very unlike me, uh, uh, people living with an epistemology that was so different uh, to mine that it was incomprehensible in the beginning to me, and say, could you help me um, in, in this sense with regard to this book Horizon? Um, 
Everyone in this room knows that hell is coming. Not hell with a small h, not something we're going to solve with technology or uh, certainly not with an election. It's coming and we have to figure out how to take care of each other and we have to figure out how to provide for our children and our grandchildren so that they have the opportunities to exercise imagination that we have had. Then maybe we have a prayer, some of us. So if you're looking for something to do in the time of global climate change and ocean acidification and methane gas pouring out of the tundra and um, I think I heard something yesterday about diversity and extinction. <laughs> Was that a wake up call for some people? Um, here's what I think is worth thinking about. Make common cause with young people. They need to know that their instincts are good and right, but yet not shaped. Many of us have experience. They need that experience. And if you can help young people tell the story that they are bound to tell for our salvation, that's a good thing in the world. I used to think, I just need to talk to people my own age with my own background about how to address these massive problems. I don't think that anymore. Because time is short. Time is so short. Our job, I think, for people my age or maybe a little bit younger, is to help the young people that you see before you shining. Help them find the language they desire. Help them tell the stories that they think will cause us to be, become whole again, to become coherent again instead of incoherent and shattered people. Make common cause with them, take care of them, and we'll be all right. As, as much as we can be all right. We, we've got to take care of each other and primarily take care of the young people, my grandchildren and my children, if they can make it and you give them the room in which they can fully imagine what they can see coming that's not dark, if they can imagine not what is pushing us into the future, but what is calling us into the future. They get that, and they can hear that song. They know what is calling them into the future because they're not yet ready to throw it in. Make common cause with them. Give them your love and let them have your history of learning. They already have the enthusiasm. They have great energy. Give them everything you've got. Um. Thank you. Um, this is a big book. Um, <clears throat> my editor, when this book was finished in a cast off of the part of the publishing process that tells you how long the book is going to be, my editor said, Barry, you brought this in under 600 pages. We're so happy. <laughs> Five, 572, I think. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I wasn't aware that there was such a barrier, but I thought if you made the book good and interesting, 600 would be okay. But. So it's, uh, this is, uh, I don't know if it's warranted for me to say this, but this book is really in some ways like a novel. And because it operates like a novel, um, I think it's, it's not, um, I, I hope to God, it doesn't drag. Um, and it's uh, impossible uh, to convey what is going on here because it's complex in the way that a novel is complex. It's not an addressing of subjects, it's the telling of, or one person's telling of the big story at the moment. So I'm just going to read a short 
piece in the middle of it, sort of picked at random, so that you know what the language is like. And a little bit about how the, how the book proceeds. As far back as I can remember, I've had a deep fear of being caught in hurricane weather or heavy seas out of sight of land. Even though I've found the sea seen from shore in almost any weather mesmerizing and soothing. Perhaps its primary attraction has been its breadth, like a stages, or the unbroken line of its meeting with the sky, or its inconstancy, or the transparency of its colors from the dark purple of prunes through tropical blues to the green of the verdigris that forms on oxidized copper. Once in Camden, Maine, walking its waterfront with a friend, the painter Alan McGee, I saw in a shop window a perfectly scaled model of a whaleboat, the type of longboat with a step mast that MacDonald, the character in the book, would have, ha would have worked from, though I didn't know of him at the time. I bought the model because it was beautiful and because it had been built with near microscopic attention to detail, the coiled lines, the oarlocks, the rigged harpoons. It was fashioned out of someone's love and perfect knowledge. I wanted it in the same room where I worked, in the room where I worked next to the model of the Martin M130. When I was a boy, I uh, adored the possibilities in that plane. Um, some of you might have met it in passing. The, there were only three built. One of them was called the China Clipper. Today the boat resides in my workroom in a glass box to keep dust from settling into its many small cavities. It's an image of me for, of, for me of courage, even of security. For a long while after I purchased it, I was not able to imagine the boat in the sort of seas I knew whalers had encountered or to regard it as anything but unsafe. One day this perception changed in the Drake Passage, that corridor of notoriously wild water that separates the tip of South America from the Antarctic Peninsula. On that day, I learned about a kind of beauty I had not until been, then been able to grasp. I was aboard a large ecotourism vessel with 130 others trying to reach the leeward side of South Georgia, 750 nautical miles southeast of Port Stanley, our point of departure in the Falkland Islands the day before. The ship, the Hanseatic, was weathering a Beaufort Force 11 storm. Sustained winds over 55 knots, chaotic seas of 40-foot waves with some 50-footers breaking over the upper decks, Hardly a spot on the surface of the water was not blanketed with sea foam. Sometimes the bow of the Hanseatic was entirely buried in a wall of water. It geysered through the anchor chain's hawse holes and crashed against the windows of the bridge. For some reason, I decided this was the time for me to address my old fear. I stepped outside on a lee deck just below the bridge with a trusted friend the polar explorer, Will Steger. Dressed in storm gear, we stood together in the cauldron of soaking air, listening to the shrieking wind tear through the superstructure. We, kick, we quickly hunkered in the shelter of a companionway with our feet spread and with death grips on the railing. We watched in astonishment as albatrosses 40 feet away navigated the chaotic wind like Olympic snowboarders glancing over to make eye contact with us, as they did. I turned at one point to see the stern of the 403-foot ship rise from the water and swing 30 feet to port. The only stillness here was the steel deck directly under our feet, which carried the shuddering of the ship as it crested into our thighs. Some time into this spectacle, I realized I was relaxed that thoughts were unfurling in my head in a normal way without panic or anxiety. What had for so long been an image of terror for me 
was now an image of something else, a kind of perfection. Here was Earth's fundamental wildness. Here was William Blake's sense of the divine in chaos. A well-traveled friend of mine, when I told him of my fear of encountering big seas offshore, had said to me of just such a storm he'd been through in the Drake Passage, I saw the face of God. When I got home from that trip, I looked differently at the whale boat in its glass case. Its oars were shipped, its sails were raised, no human figure is aboard. I now sense the daring in its architecture. Imagine the seamanship that would keep it from capsizing in heavy weather. I could appreciate more deeply its integrity, which is chiefly what had made it attractive. The subtlest memory of that hour I spent watching the storm from one of the Hanseatic's upper decks is that by standing that close to a force that might easily have killed me if I became inattentive, inattentive, I'd fed both a sense of gratitude for still having at the age of 57 a life I could lead and a sense of forgiveness for the harm any random person might do to another. In those minutes of gazing at the boiling cistern of waves and watching the albatrosses addressing the storm with great seriousness, I could fix only on what I admired most often in other human beings, their enduring grace and poise. As I look back on Cook's experiences in the Pacific and look at the model of the M130 sitting in my studio, and consider my fascination with the nautical details of Cook's resolution, I can see that I have spent much of a lifetime thinking about such conveyances. When the time comes, what sort of person will be at the helm for us? And how will we know whether we can trust this navigator? M much, thank you. Um, there are two navigators at the center of Horizon. One is James Cook, um, whom I could never bring up the um, ire to despise. Yes, he was a, a colonizer, and he did despicable things like the conquistadores. But he was a human being, too, and a man of his time, and I thought he did very well by human standards, establishing a kind of navigation that made people understand better where they were in the world, by giving us a world. Before Cook, you might not be able to find a place that somebody else had found. After Cook, you could go there. You could fix latitude and longitude as he did and find the place, the mystery place, again. So I, I fell short of despising Cook, which I think when you're dealing with historical figures, um, Annie Prue said to me once, oh my God, Barry, you'd find something good to say about Caligula. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> there, but this was a man we all know about. We learned about him in school. <clears throat> but I found another man. His name was Ranald MacDonald, not that person. <laughs> but uh, I came across his correspondence um, and his a draft of his autobiography in the Eastern Washington Historical Society building in Spokane, Washington. Um, he was a mestizo, like so many of us today. His mother was a Chinook woman. His father was a Hudson Bay Company factor. And he fell in the middle world. So he lived most of his younger life, till he was six, seven, eight, with his mother in what is today called Astoria, in Chinook society. And then he moved to the HBC um, post or fort at Vancouver, what is today Vancouver uh, 
Washington, not Vancouver, BC. And there he learned uh, his ABCs and his one, two, threes and all the rest of it. And his father wanted him to become a factor, uh, someone who would run his own fort, a trading post, um, and overlooked the fact that that wasn't going to happen for a man who was neither Indian nor white. He wasn't going to be permitted that. When he was about 10 years old, he heard about three Japanese sailors who washed ashore in a ship they had been in, if memory serves, for uh, four or five months. They had been dismasted and caught up in North Pacific currents and washed ashore uh, at a place called Uzet in Washington. Um, this happened fairly frequently at that time, as many of you know. Uh, Japan was closed to the outer world. Melville called it the double bolted kingdom of Japan. No white people were allowed in and those that ended up there because of a shipwreck, a lot of whaling in the Sea of Japan at the time, were uh, summarily sent home uh, the long way by, by going to Amsterdam to start with. Um, but he heard about these men that had washed ashore and to his eye they looked so much like Indians. And he wondered where were they from and he learned that they were from Japan. And he thought in his young boy way, oh my God, they have no idea what's coming for them. It's the same thing that came for my people and somebody has to warn them. So he went on to Winnipeg and went to school in Winnipeg, I think until he was 14. He was abused by white men who said that he had no right to fall in love with this young white woman and he should never try to do such a thing ever again in his life. So he went to Ontario and started work in a bank and he found the same thing. For him, there wasn't equity. There was nothing. He ended up in Sank Harbor uh, on Long Island where he uh, went to work on a whaler and it's unclear. Some people think that he worked on slavers as well, bringing blacks from West Africa to illegally at the time to North America. And when he was about to leave on a voyage, a whaling voyage, um, he made a deal with the captain and his deal was this. Once the hold is full of sperm whale oil in the Sea of Japan, I want you to give me a boat and some supplies and drop me overboard. And I am going to go ashore on Hokkaido, the northern island of Japan, and present myself to Ainu people and I'm going to tell them that I'm a shipwrecked sailor and I know that I'll be immediately put under house arrest, but I have some business that I want to do in Japan and I'm asking you, let that be my pay, what they call the lay, that my lay is going to be to get this boat. So he did that and he came ashore in Hokkaido. He presented himself to Ainu people, the indigenous people of Hokkaido and the Imperial Japanese government intervened and put him under house arrest and eventually he um, ended up in Nagasaki at the court of the um, shoguns. His belief was that if you don't quickly adjust, you will be visited by these white people from Europe and America and they will tear your country apart because they want the things that you have and there will be no quarter given and you need to learn English and I'm here to teach you English. So he did, he spent nine months there, roughly nine months in uh, Nagasaki teaching the courtiers to speak English and when Perry came to Edo, to Tokyo. He presented himself in the court and was astonished 
that they all spoke English. And the men that he came closest to emotionally said to each other, this is exactly what Ranald MacDonald warned us about and we are prepared for this. So uh, he, he went on, um, uh, he left Japan, he sailed in the Straits of Malacca, he worked in gold fields in Australia, always trying to make a living at the edge because he was mestizo. And his life fascinated me because he was a remarkable and, and, and a, a, a man with a great imagination and he'd been sidelined uh, in history because he was mixed race. Um, General Custer's wife heard about him and came and visited him late in his life on the Colville Indian Reservation in Washington and made a mockery of him in an article in Harper's. What a silly man. I saw at the Oregon Historical Society um, a letter that he wrote to a woman whose name I'm embarrassed to say I've forgotten, um, who was the first person to write a biography of him. And scrawled at the bottom of the letter is, please do not do to me what Mrs. General Custer did. So he died without children, he never married, and he's buried in a fairly obscure place off the Colville Indian Reservation up on the Canadian border. And I, I knew I had to go and see his grave and in my way apologize uh, for the fact that he was thrown out. He never made it into history. So I did that twice. Um, and then he worked his way through my imagination and he ended up here as a counterpoint to Captain James Cook. Um, and I would imagine these conversations that those two men might have had and where it would take place and what they would say to each other and how a common history in the sea would have helped them get over some of the bumps of racial superiority and I think actually that Cook could have done that. Anyway, that's why he turns up briefly there and Cook too throughout the book. Um, I guess in part, you know, every writer will tell you the same thing. You write a book and then you begin to understand it. And one of the things I realized I was writing about was this big idea. Hell is coming. What is the conveyance that will bear us away and who will be the navigator? So that, you can understand the book in that way. Um, and we don't have much time, of course to look for the navigators or figure out what the figurative conveyance is. But it is within our skill set to do that. And we need to do it. And we, ho we have to hope that there's enough room aboard for our children and get after it right away. So thank you. And Melissa and I are now going to have a conversation. Um, I thank you again, all of you, for coming. It's such a great pleasure to be able to stand in front of an audience that cares about the same things that you do and you pray to God that what you wrote in the book will help every woman, every man imagine where their place is in this great terrifying mystery as we embark. I'm gonna introduce uh, Melissa K. Nelson, um, who is joining Barry for conversation. Um, Melissa is the president and CEO of the Cultural Conservancy, um, is an oncologist, writer, editor, media maker, maker, and native scholar activist. Her work is dedicated to indigenous rights and revitalization, native science and biocultural diversity, ecological ethics and sustainability, and the renewal and celebration of community health and cultural arts. She is the editor of Original Instructions, Indigenous Teachings for a Sustainable Future. Melissa, will you join us on the stage? Wow. Whew. 
What a beautiful evening. I'm so happy to be here with all of you, so many beloved friends and colleagues and mentors over the decades, and to be here with this guy. Really beautiful. Um, thank you to those poets for the uh, honoring earlier of Barry's incredible life. I think we all appreciated that, and as he said, it's hard to put words in this room after <laughs> all of that uh, beauty, all of that wisdom. I'm very uh, excited to be able to ask Barry some questions. I've been pondering them for uh, many days, and the wisdom that you already shared this evening uh, with your metaphors of navigation and uh, so many uh, areas really have me thinking about this idea that you said is the big picture of your book, that hell is coming. And um, also that we have to love our youth. Yes. And I'm a teacher and I work with a lot of mestizo youth, like myself, mestizo youth, mixed race youth, who are really trying to reconcile uh, that hell is coming and yet what are we to do? Hmm. So in all of your explorations and seeing so many different cultures, um, how have you been able to see signs or signals of reconciliation or redemption given the level of rupture, the level mm. of incoherence and fragmentation happening simultaneously? Um, it's a very bold and arrogant thing to write a book. Um, and you, you're always thinking, uh, why was something like this given to me who is so stupid? And what, what you do to try to save yourself is go out in places that you're afraid of, like the deck of the Hanseatic, and discover what other people know as everyday life. Uh, many people live in hurricane all day long. So I went to a group called um, Mercy Corps, and they're headquartered in Portland, and talked to the executive director and said, I, I really need to see plight. And I'm wondering if you can help me set up some, some trip that I could, I could begin to cope with that. So they said yes, and we developed a trip, and. I flew to Lebanon and, and talked to people in Palestinian refugee camps and saw the usual kind of heartbreaking things. I spoke to a woman who had a key hanging on her door jam, and I asked her, what's that for? And she said, that's my home, and I'm going back there one day. I hung it up in 1948, and I'm going home one day. So I, I, I process those things, not with any sense of somebody's right, somebody's wrong. You know, the worst thing you can do is end the, end the inquiry by pointing your finger at somebody. So I just tried to absorb that and then I went to uh, Tajikistan, the most impoverished of the old Soviet republics, 85% unemployment in some of the villages, and processed that and uh, what I didn't know at the time was a Chinese effort to build a railroad into Afghanistan to take advantage of one of the world's last major copper deposits. They wanted it all. And here were people unemployed, 85% unemployed. So mm. I looked at mm. that and then I went to um, Afghanistan and uh, looked at some things there and I was sitting with my host one night and we were having dinner and he said, listen, <clears throat> the worst thing really that the Taliban ever did was destroying those Buddhas that were in the big niches at Bamiyan. And I said, you know what? I think I would learn as much by going and looking at those empty niches as I would have learned two years ago going to Bamiyan and seeing them there in their niches. So mm -hmm. he arranged security and uh, 
tribal arrangements and whatnot. There, every time I went to a place like that, I went to say, to, to understand, is this still us? Is this who we are? Or can we be something else quickly? Is that, are there stories that would guide us, you know, through these places? And the last place I went to was to northern Sumatra, to um, the city of Banda Aceh, where uh, a tsunami um, took about 225,000 lives in about 20 minutes. Uh, the tsunami that went through there, um, nothing but wreckage and destroyed families. I took six men to dinner one night and with a translator asked them, please tell me what happened to you. And many of these men, well, they were all fishermen and they were offshore that morning, 8.30 in the morning on a Sunday morning. They were all offshore fishing and they saw the tsunami coming. It was only about a foot high and it went past the boats at 60 or 70 miles an hour. They knew what it was and they knew that when it hit uh, uh, Aceh province it, it was going to end for most everyone they knew, which is what happened. But I, I wanted them to explain to me, what is the, how did you recover? And one man, I remember, had lost 22, 21 members of his immediate family, um, his mother, his father, his, his wife's parents, all of his children, his wife, aunts and uncles, they all lived in the same house, everybody dead. And it's the, uh, Aceh province in Sumatra is a very conservative Muslim um, part of Indonesia. And he said, you know, we don't have a situation here where you can, uh, you know, you've got to start again, you've got to have children, you've got to make a family. But we don't, we, we can't just walk up to a woman and say, uh, hi. Uh. <laughs> so he explained this very elaborate way that he, uh, he saw a woman that uh, he liked and, uh, or he thought he might like, and he had another man go and inquire if she was married and uh, uh, possibly they might get married. So they just, he said, you just start with what you've got and you rebuild. Mm -hmm. So I called my wife from Jakarta when I was on my way home and I said, I have more faith in humanity now than I had when I got off the plane in Beirut. Mm -hmm. I've seen nothing but heartbreak and I've seen so many women and men with poise, authority, a command of their emotions, and the ability to act to stabilize people. You know, a huge difference between a society like ours and most Aboriginal societies, at least as far as I have seen, is we're interested in progress. They're interested in stability. I think most native communities I've been in in North America, the thing to prize is stability. Here comes the tsunami. Uh, here comes one disaster after another. Can you weather it? And you weather it by um, listening to what the elders say about how to react. So if you have a society built around those women and men who constitute the memory of our history, and who have uh, a unique kind of perspicacity um, and you support the stability of a society where these women and these men will be making the big decisions and I will do what they tell me to do. I feel completely respected, not diminished, not marginalized. I'm a full human being and I know as I move around in the community that I'm well regarded by everybody. If I do that and then they make the decision that I'm not capable of making, I just need to say, what do you want me to do? So things like, uh, things like that deliberate kind of research 
leads you to understand some how to how to outline some of what we need to know I think you know I'm really mm -hmm. saying my people are in trouble can you help mm -hmm. you've mm -hmm. you know Pintanjandara people for example in the Northern Territory I can say that to them they've been there successfully stable for 35 40,000 years that tells you that they they know something <laughs> yes. so so would you agree that many people are saying, uh, who are our navigators given these turbulent times and people are looking to indigenous peoples um, who've had that stability? A absolutely. This mm -hmm. is why native peoples are not at the table with all of these, um, I'm trying to not disparage, uh, <laughs> with you know the usual crew of <laughs> wealthy white men just isn't somebody keeping track here these are the same people that have been making the same mistakes for dozens of years do you really think that they will be able to provide a solution for the disaster they have created <laughs> no well why aren't the Ranald McDonald's why aren't the the, the mestizos at the table, you know, show, I've right. known many, I'm sure you know more than I do, um, men and women that are senior people to me, and I think, why aren't they ever asked to be at the table? Mm -hmm. They're not because their skin is the wrong color. We don't like paying attention to that, we don't like to hear it, but the fact is, everybody with a PhD is not smart and doesn't belong at the table. It's the, the articulate grown-ups, the people that no longer need to be supervised, they understand what to do. They, in our idiom we say they've gotten over themselves. Mm -hmm. They understand what's at stake for everybody and their position is uh, how do we achieve stability and um, I think at least most of the elders that I talk to are, are driven by uh, this thought Whatever we do, we must be sure that no one is left behind. You cannot make a decision for one group of people if another group of people will suffer for it. Better that we all die together than one group gets all of the advantages and the energy of the others and goes how far? Not very far. Yeah, yeah. So. Yes. I want to. I want to tell a positive story. <laughs> um, back in the '70s, a group of uh, academics, um, anthropologists, were felt that a Polynesian people who got to Hawaii got there on purpose. They weren't aimlessly drifting in the Pacific Ocean. They knew exactly what they were doing. At the time, most anthropologists, these as well as a minority group, thought, no, you know, they're, they're like Indians, right? They, uh, they don't know very much, and they certainly don't know how to navigate, and et cetera, et cetera. So this small group of white, mostly men, I think, um, re they encouraged each other with this idea that Polynesian peoples knew exactly what they were doing. And they, they sketched out what they thought, because the vessels exist in, actually in some drawings that Cook's, navigate, Cook's uh, artists aboard the ships did. So they, they knew what a double-hulled exploration canoe looked like. So they began playing with that and then they approached the Native Hawaiian community and said, um, want to work with us? And the Native Hawaiian community was circumspect academics. Um, but they said, yeah, okay, what do you have in mind? And these white guys said, why don't you go and find the last vestiges of Native navigation techniques in the Eastern Pacific 
and see what you can come up with. So these guys went to the Caroline Islands and they found a man who was still navigating in the old way and he began to teach them and these two groups of people, educated white academics and native Hawaiians without most of them I think with benefit of a college education, came together and figured out what the double-hulled exploration canoe that they had read about and seen some sketches of what it really looked like. And then this, the, the academics said, we are not going to sail this. We'll build it with you, but you have to sail it. You have to sail it from here, as it turned out, from Maui to um, uh, Tahiti. Tahiti. Mm -hmm. um, and they did. They had no navigation equipment like compasses and you know, the sextant and mm -hmm. they just figured out by studying with this man from the Caroline Islands how to do it in the old way and they sailed that ship the Hokolea to Tahiti and uh, I remember interviewing a young man uh, he was a Cook Islander about 23 or 24 he was now a train navigator. We went to dinner uh, in uh, Huaheni, a small island in the Polynesian archipelago. And his friends were saying, show him the, show him the tattoo, show him the tattoo. <laughs> and he was the equivalent of red-faced, embarrassed about his tattoo. But these guys had all pitched in and bought him this tattoo in... Uh, in uh, uh, Papeete in, in uh, uh, Tahiti and uh, so he finally he turned his back to myself and this other man and he pulled his t-shirt up over his head and tattooed on his back was an iguana the tip of its tail was right at the young man's cossack and it wound across his spine like that and its claws were like this on his back and shining through the whole thing were the southern constellations mm -hmm. and the iguana's head turned to look right out from the back at whoever was looking at the tattoo mm -hmm. you, and he's looking like this and uh, his, the, the head of the iguana was here at the last cervical vertebrae so when you looked at it you thought wow there is an animal that really knows what it's doing. <laughs> so then he pulled his shirt down, you know, we all had a laugh about it. But um, he said to me later that night, uh, when this started, we were afraid. Um, but we showed that this could be done. We showed that where it seemed empty and trackless and without features, we could get to a place we couldn't see by doing the navigation in the old way. And so Native Hawaiian people are saying to other people, don't be afraid in the trackless world where you don't know where you're going. We can show you that it can be done. Just watch us and work with us. So that you see something like that, and you just want to turn around and embrace whoever is right next to you. You know, <laughs> you you feel such an enthusiasm for the 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 light that is burning in them. They did something everybody said that they weren't bright enough to do, and they did it beautifully. And they didn't say anything to us who thought we knew how to navigate. We don't know how to navigate in this that we're in. But they do, and they're willing to help. I mean, this is something about Native people that makes you speechless in spite of everything that has been done, not just to Native people in North America, but in, in Africa and in uh, uh, Australia. Still willing to help. Still willing to tell you what we know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just asking you to listen and shut up. Exactly, and those Hawaiians and other 
uh, Pacific Islanders after crisscrossing Moana Nui, uh, the mighty Pacific, several times, they said, we're going to do a world voyage. And they just finished that world voyage last year to right. again demonstrate uh, and to spread a message of peace and unity yes. and um, protection of the oceans and of the waters. Right. And yet there's so many people who theoretically get that and get that indigenous peoples know things that they don't know and yet the reality of our structures in terms of science academia um, policy still are so suspect of trusting indigenous knowledge and actually implementing and making real change with it. Like you said, when you look around the power tables at B, they're the same people. Yeah. And I love quoting Winona LaDuke, who said, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And, and so even though there is, with folks like yourself and people in the room who really see the, the wisdom and knowledge of indigenous peoples and are investing it in a real way, <clears throat> there's still such a lag time uh, with the powers that be entrusting that that tattoo on that man's back was um, science. Right? It was mm -hmm. a text. The symbols yes. there were giving meaning and messages. But because indigenous knowledge is often seen as qualitative, not uh, measurement in the same way, uh, it's in weaving patterns and mm -hmm. Mayan uh, weavings and California Indian basket traditions, they don't see it as real knowledge or real science. And I think there's some gestalt shift or paradigm shift that still needs to happen to shift the center of knowledge from textbooks, as much as we love books here, to something that is more three-dimensional and phenomenological, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, I got very lucky in 1976 I wanted to learn about wolves um, and I read a book very tedious scientific papers about phylogenetic change and uh, in the middle of this compendium there was a paper by a man named Bob Stevenson co-authored by a man named Bob Aguk a Nunami Eskimo man and I sat right up in my hotel bed when I saw that name and thought, hmm, this young man from Wisconsin mm -hmm. and this man from Anuktuvuk Pass in the Brooks Range, what are they writing about together? Mm -hmm. So it turned out that it was a mutual respect. And the story behind it was that Bob Stevenson got um, a ton of money because of the development of the pipeline and there was plenty of money around to throw out to do research on how the pipeline was going to affect caribou migration and things like that. So he had all this money and instead of doing the kind of white thing which was to radio collar a bunch of wolves and fly around in a small aircraft with antenna and track them and write it all down on a piece of paper he got on a plane and flew to Anaktubik Pass and introduced himself to the 110 people who lived there and said, I'm here to try to understand Amakuk, the wolf. And they were suspicious, but uh, then something very interesting happened. Uh, everybody got a really bad flu and they were all in bed and throwing up and diarrhea and kind of a mess. And uh, he didn't get the flu, and he just went from house to sod house to sod house and cleaned up and, and washed clothes and bed sheets, and he did that for 10 or 15 days. <laughs> then the uh, women said, hmm. And the first time I went to Anaktubik Pass with him, he got off the plane and all these women in their long dresses came waddling down to the airstrip. Oh, Bob, oh, Bob. <laughs> so he, he endeared himself as a human being to them. 
And then he really learned about wolves. He taught me about wolves. And I, uh, much of what I absorbed was uh, what today is called traditional um, ecological knowledge. You see this acronym now in, in scientific journals, TEK, T-E-K, traditional environmental knowledge. But back then, nobody talked about that. Only white people could understand what animals were doing. It, it, it's so starkly ignorant that you, you wonder how they could manage to mask the truth here. It was a 24-hour-a-day job. And now, now that's changed, you know, that most uh, field biologists work uh, closely with traditional people and that mistrust of the other epistemology is not as profound. But they have a very difficult time breaking through into the silos of academe, trying to knock the door down and say, hey, you know, these people weren't sitting out there smoking cigars all the time. Mm -hmm. They actually lived there and they had relations that were complex and multi-leveled with all animals and they know way more than you do. You know, they, they know way more than the guy who goes up north to watch polar bears for six weeks for two summers and is ready to talk to you about what polar bears do. Wow. Um, I, I still remember this, this word in Ninuktitut, I'll butcher it, but it was, uh, there were a, a group of uh, Inuit men who had been hired as guides for these young fellows that came up from Canadian Wildlife Services to do research about polar bears. And they were standing at a distance doing this, which for Eskimo people uh, is very disrespectful to, to take your limbs away from your body and occupy more space than you should. Um, so they were out there talking to each other about, yeah, this fits there, and then they go over there, and then there we go, we'll fly over here, and all that. So <laughs> this one man said, meaning, it can't be learned. <laughs> you can't learn this. So there's some, there's, I, I'm very glad after 40 years to see that, that, um, I keep saying white, but it's just that culture, you know, it's a pejorative, I guess, I'm sorry. And, um, that our culture is capable of learning. But you're right, it's so slow. And animals are dying every day. We're losing animals we don't even have names for. And the fact that nobody much cares um, is heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. I have remembered so many times walking along crying because I could not see how we, this was this slaughter was ever going to stop. And we would sit down with animals and talk to them the way we talk to each other and ask their ins for their insights and, and for their guidance. Um, I think one of the w one of the reasons that that people in my culture are impatient with traditional people is they are both jealous of the of the ability of traditional people to have conversation to share a moral universe with with animals and ashamed that when they had the opportunity to do that, they decided it was what children did. So they destroyed that part of themselves that was able to communicate with non-human beings. If you, if you talk to people about the kind of intimacy that you've appreciated with wild animals, you know, I'm talking about <clears throat> wild animals are, uh, they're wild animals that are not free animals. The gorillas and barungas are, are not free animals. Uh, they're, they're watched over by guards and they're visited every day by people. So they're living in the wild, but they're not free. 
They're not free animals. And when you encounter free animals, it is possible um, if you just quiet down and open yourself up to learn uh, about the nature of the place where you are by just watching them, watching them in that way in which they encounter each other and encounter the landscape and make room for each other around feeding around a carcass or something. And it, it gives you, uh, I'll tell you what it does, is it destroys your sense that you are alone. I, I said to a Inupiaq uh, woman once, she saw me walking along on the beach and she said, she, when I came back through the village, she said, what's wrong with you? And I said, um, I'm homesick. And she said, oh, Barry, don't you know that when you miss your place, your place misses you? <laughs> and that insight was, uh, I saw in, in a split second, I saw the loneliness of my own people. Because when they're not with other human beings, they feel not only are they alone, but they're lonely. And when they are part of their place, you, you see that it's impossible once you're a part of your place to ever be lo lonely or alone. You're always with, you're always... She was talking to me as she moved her fingers over my hand and I, I, don't, I still don't understand, but the way she moved her hand was like saying that all the fingers come together here, you see. It's the, the hand is never alone. She meant something like that. So, you know, every day you would encounter something that saves you from loneliness. And that alone would be, um, for that alone you'd walk across Australia to be with people that, un that had already figured out how to solve that problem. I am alone. You refer to uh, the concept of a moral universe. A shared moral a shared, universe. So you're never alone. You're never lonely in that. And many other Native writers have talked about moral landscapes. Enrique Samon tells really beautiful stories as a um, Tadahumata man about ironwood and how the stories about ironwood. It's always, it's a woman actually, and she's always watching you and always paying attention to mm -hmm. you. And um, the Rotuman people of the South Pacific have the concept that the land has eyes. Yes. And they also have the concept the land has teeth. <laughs> 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 and so in your travels and in your own experience living in place in the Mackenzie River watershed for over 50 years, what has it taught you, that river, in terms of the moral landscape and, and being at one with it? I don't know if I could articulate it. Um, I I think about this time, you know, I'd on, only been living there on the river for eight years, I think, and um, I was trying to understand the place and the residents. And, um, and then I published uh, Wolves and Men, and I went on book tour and there's a famous show back at that time, some of you will remember it, the Dick Cavett Show. <laughs> so I did the Dick Cavett Show and, uh, you know, that's a big deal, a big national television night show or whatever. And I realized I had been in all of these cities talking about that book. And when I was flying home, I began to worry uh, because I could not make it clear to people that what they read was not something that belonged to me. It was given to me, and I was trying to pass it along. I was a kind of carrier. But so much attention was on me that it was disorienting, and it made me feel... Um, it made me feel very uncomfortable. And when I got home, landed at the airport, my wife picked me up, we went back home, and all the way upriver I thought, what's going to happen 
if I get home and drop my bags off and go for a walk in the woods and feel everything turn its back on me because they're ashamed of what I did, which was to pretend in front of these cameras and newspaper people that it was me that the book was about myself, that I was promoting myself. And that didn't happen. And because it didn't, I thought, well, I'll now be here the rest of my life because I was forgiven. And that the trees and the elk and the bear and the river otter and osprey and they all they all understood that we all have to learn and the thing that I had to learn was make sure nobody thinks that it's about you or that you made this you were taught and you need to convey that so you know for years until actually horizon the hardest part of horizon for me was writing about myself but I understood that if this story wasn't told by a real person, then a lot of people wouldn't know whether they could believe it or not. It had to be somebody who uh, not only behaved foolishly from time to time, but who really didn't know very much about a lot of things. And in that way, by showing the 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 transparent humanity, um, I could get rid of the larger self, you know, somebody who was diving under the ice in Antarctica for three weeks, which is, you know, it's a very unusual thing to do, but I didn't want that. I wanted to say, but don't you understand, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't be able to talk about what I found. So the fact that I did something like that is incidental. The real thing is what was seen. Mm -hmm. So the, the opening chapters of the book are you know, autobiographical, um, and then it opens up into this archaeological site in the Canadian High Arctic, and the next chapter is set in the Galapagos Islands, and the, Next chapter is set in northern Kenya, where I spent time with people who worked for Richard Leakey, looking for hominid fossils. Um, because all this was to find, who are we? Who are we? And then the, the chapter that's set in Australia, and finally in the great tabula rasa of Antarctica. I went back and forth there, I think on six trips, six long trips, and camped three separate times, I think, for a long while in the interior of Antarctica. Um, because I thought, well, if you were trying to imagine something across, out there, over the horizon, that was a better way of life, if you were able to develop a life in which you shared a moral universe with other living things, and not just made up all the rules for everybody by yourself, what would that look like? And Antarctica seemed the place to to pray about that, to, to, to look for illumination. So that's how the book is yeah. set up, you know, that... Uh, and one thing that did occur to me uh, consciously was that so many of us feel that we're in the bottom of some kind of funnel, that we're constrained and forced in and uh, and it, it's very dark and tight down there in the bottom of the funnel. And I wanted to do something by writing that would bring everybody up into the surface waters of, of the funnel shape. And I thought if you can do that, then women and men who are way smarter than I am would have the room to think. that it, This is like, you know, d d it's the difference between being in a in a meter, meter, meter box with padded walls trying to figure out uh, what you were going to do. You, the, the constraint and the pressure is terrible and inescapable. And it occurred to me that 
one of the reasons we have so much trouble thinking in the West is because incidentally we're trained to two-dimensional surfaces like computer screens and movies or whatever and we don't we, we find it difficult to get behind, and that's one word we use, and we never look behind ourselves. So we're always in this tight place where there's not enough room to maneuver, to think, to imagine what it is that might be possible for us. So there's a constant effort through the book to create big open space in which we can think without panicking. Um, you know, so I was always flying kites in Antarctica at 30 below and I just wanted to, I, th I thought the only animal that lives in the interior of Antarctica is the wind and the only way you can learn about the wind is by flying an acrobatic kite. Look at this little guy oh, coming through. Speaking of flying he, through the wind. Yeah, I got a story he was interested in. Um, so that, you know, there was a, a, a purpose and I had I'd thought for a long time about how often we uh, this is very s simplified and silly maybe <laughs> and maybe I'm wrong and you can certainly say what are you talking about um, but when I stand at a distance from the social movements of the late 20th century the women's movement the environmental movement the Native American movement uh, etc etc every one of those social movements is a reaction to hierarchy it's, it's saying, as soon as you start to put one thing over another, you're creating disaster. We, 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 can't make, we can't make anything work if this person is automatically, by virtue of race or whatever, better than this person. So I, I wanted to dismantle the spatial hierarchy that I feel is a trap for us. Mm -hmm. The Arctic is not the top of the world, any more than Antarctica is the bottom of the world. And if you, if you, uh, there's a place in the, in the Galapagos chapter where I'm trying to sleep on a very hot evening in a, in a room, and I do what I think many of us do. I, I leaned back in the bed un, until my head was looking out at the stars in the sky upside down. <laughs> of course, they're not upside down. Um, but when I did that, I thought, that's, that's a wall you don't need. What if it wasn't upside down? What if it wasn't to the, to the left of Polaris? What, what if you were standing in some other place where it was to the right of Polaris because you were standing upside down? So when you begin to play with that, which is kind of a child's fascination with funny, unusual things like that, what you understand is that in order to get out of this sense of being imprisoned, you need to break the space up into unconventional volumes. And if you can do that, there's more room around the table and there is more opportunity to imagine everything differently. What have we got to lose if we only have, say, 20 years, if we start to imagine things fundamentally in a different way than we have? You, you, you're, you're breaking away from the form of governance we have and you're breaking away from the belief that, that corporate entities can do anything to help. You're just saying, no, that's not going to work. We don't have much time. We don't have time to argue about it. You know, we're just making that decision, no. <laughs> but we believe we can't do that. Why not? I love your emphasis on uh, alternative ways of knowing and different ways of knowing. And I loved how um, in your introduction that your emphasis on verbs as so many native languages are more verb-based verb than noun-based. Yeah. And so the emphasis on language revitalization um, I think is so critical for this time because learning different ways of knowing in the English language is, is somewhat imprisoning or confining, and yet there's still many ways to do it. And I love how you're speaking spatially about kind of getting back to almost like the stem cells of consciousness. Yes, yeah. Right? 
Well, that's yeah. very impressive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and as human beings on this planet, right? I mean, that's what we have to do as human beings to really recognize our wholeness and unity with the planet, with each other, and with all critters. But that seems so difficult in these times. We put up these barriers and these boundaries. We're afraid. You know, we're really, we're, you know, we, and we have difficulty recognizing the fact that we're terrified. But, the, the, you know, in, in some of these trips I've been on where I've, I've seen the god-awful worst of human beings' behavior to others, um, it, it, does, it does frighten you, and you become afraid for everybody. You know, there, um, when I, I saw the outline of this book, what I, what I wanted to try to find um, in 1989, and I signed a contract to write the book with the understanding from Knopf, very generous of them, that I, I wasn't going to begin it, not, not for decades. I, I just um, wasn't capable of it. I didn't think I, had, I was able to write it. It just was a ridiculous idea. Um, so I said to somebody the other day, you know, this, I did sign that contract 30 years ago, and for 25 years the book worked on me, and then for five years I worked on the book. <laughs> so that's how that, that, that came about. But there were many times when um, I, I, I have said to young writers, if I wasn't afraid sitting in front of the typewriter, still work at a typewriter. Uh, if I wasn't afraid, um, I know I would know that whatever I was going to write wasn't going to be any good. Um, you, you have to be afraid and you have to learn how to move with grace in the middle of your periods of fear. Because you, in that way, you give example to other people who are afraid to the point of paralysis. and you need to keep everybody moving and reach down and not and be compassionate and I, I know that it was like somebody gave it to me when I was a child don't be afraid keep walking move in grace look for those things that feed that sense of poise look for it it's always there no matter how dark it is um, or at least that's that's how I thought of it, and so it was there. <laughs> mm. um, I I think that what what is coming? It's not coming for us. It's indifferent to us. But but what is coming? The tsunami that is coming is telling us we've we've got to be looking for people who are just as afraid but not paralyzed and be sure that we, we stay close, that, that there will be some people who are not afraid, they're not going to collapse, and who are just waiting to provide cover for you. I saw that in the streets in Kabul for a couple of weeks where, where were the really broken down people and where were the people that everybody was leaning on? They weren't in government, they weren't in the military, they weren't in one version or another of, of capitalism and corporate life. They were just these women and men who were, um, they could not be crushed. And so that they could give shelter to everybody who was losing their mind. They could take care of, of them. You know, I saw th this woman I met in Bali once. We worked on a seminar together and she was the president of, of uh, Red Crescent, the Muslim version of Red Cross, Islamic version of Red Cross. Mm -hmm. And she lived in Kabul and she said, listen, if you ever come to Afghanistan, you must come and stay with us. So I did. And um, so I went with her one day out to uh, the complex, the compound, where Red Crescent worked. And uh, she had a lot of things to do, you know, so he pretty much left me on my own. She introduced me to a young man and he walked me through the complex. Um, and 
We were walking back across this compound toward the office where he worked, and I thought, oh, he's walking me back there because she's finishing something, and I'll hook up with her there in that office. Um, so we opened, he opened these two doors, and we walked into a towering corridor and a, a big hallway going this way and a big hallway going that way and the doors are right here so we walked into this cross space and he closed the door behind us and I looked sideways and I saw this woman who was in her 50s I guess and she had a bed sheet uh, grasped like this around her and she looked at me and him and she, she just started to come alive and she let go of the sheet and it fell away, she was naked and she ran toward us, moving her mouth but making no sound. She, oh. she caught within about 20 feet of us and then whatever she was watching or whatever she believed, she no longer believed and she stopped. And she turned around and ran away mm -hmm. and picked the sheet up and clutched it to her chest and just stared into space that kind of... She went back into herself. And I know that that man did not want me to see that. But I did. And he said, um, this is a woman's building they are locked in their rooms. Most of them lost their husbands or their children in the war. They really can't cope with anything. And sometimes, he said, they get out of their rooms. But as much to say, I'm sorry you had to see that. And when I got out of the building, of course, I couldn't forget her. And I say at the beginning, of Horizon, that there were things that I saw one place or another that would not let me alone. And she was one of those things um, that, that created for me the urgency of finding another way to understand um, what we were facing. Um, so, uh, the, the out, what I was saying is the outline for the book, I wrote that outline in 1989, but I didn't understand the book, so there were the only, excuse me, the only things that I added to the outline were a, a short piece uh, about my taking my grandson to see the USS Arizona. I wanted him to see what we do to each other but in an environment, in a beautiful Hawaiian sunshine and very peaceful, I wanted to be able to introduce him to, we do this, we do this to each other, and explain that this necropolis with, there's still 1,700 men entombed in that ship. And I thought, if he's with me, and it's a beautiful day, and I don't raise my voice or um, frighten him. He'll, he'll be able to manage this. This is a story that he can manage at his age. And uh, we went snorkeling after that, my wife and I and him. And um, then Deborah and Owen went to the ocean at the beach. We were at a, at a, at a seaside hotel and I was sitting by the pool reading and they were, I could see them in the ocean there watching them and and he was waving from the wall of this wave, Grandpa look at me and I was waving to him and then I would be reading and the whole hotel was full of Japanese people and here we were at Pearl Harbor and I was thinking how can I make this apparent that once upon a time, there was Pearl Harbor, and now, now there's not that, and this is what we're looking for. And in the middle of this kind of random thinking, 
this Japanese woman walked along the edge of the pool and in an astonishingly graceful movement just launched herself into space and conformed her body in a way to make a dive. And when she hit the water, this great arc of water flew up into the sky like a flamenco dancer's skirt, and it all was dazzling in the sunshine. And it, what, it filled me with a sense of wanting everyone to be all right, of wanting everybody to be all right. And yet I knew, I knew it was coming. And that's, I, I needed some way to begin the moral universe that the book opens up into. And also say something that I feel this enormous responsibility to this young man who's my grandson. I want him to be okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much. Very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>